Good afternoon. My name is Ruth Kruger and I work in knowledge translation and communications for ANDRI, the Ontario Neurodegenerative Disease Research Initiative. Thanks so much today, everybody, for joining us. We're very pleased to have a panel of four distinguished speakers who will speak to you about different aspects of taking care of your body, mind and soul during the COVID pandemic. Some quick housekeeping rules for you. For optimal viewing, we suggest you use the speaker view on your Zoom settings. Those are in the top right hand corner. Everybody on the webinar is muted today, so sound can come across clearly as we have many people on the line. If you have any questions as the speakers present, please type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screens. We will try to have them answered at the end of the session today. If we don't get your questions answered in time, please feel free to email them at, at info at andre.ca. That's info at ondri.ca, and we will get you an answer. The session is being recorded and will be posted on our website at andre.ca. Thank you to our partners as well, the Ontario Brain Institute, the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario, Heart and Stroke, Parkinson's Canada, ALS Society of Canada, the Provincial Geriatric Leadership Office, and the Mint Memory Clinics. First up, I'm very proud to introduce Dr. Mario Macellis. Dr. Macellis obtained his bachelor degree MSc in Pharmacology, along with his medical training at the University of Toronto. He then obtained his PhD in Clinical Neuroscience, also from the University of Toronto. A clinician scientist in neurology at Sunnybrook Health Science Centre, Dr. Macellis also serves as the Director of the Cognitive and Movement Disorders Clinic at Sunnybrook. Dr. Macellis serves as a lead on the Andre Research Initiative, He's the Associate Professor of, of Medicine at the University of Toronto and has many other appointments and affiliations in the field of neurology. Please help me welcome Dr. Mario Macellis. He will speak briefly about Andre, where his research has been and where it's going, and then he'll delve into his experiences interacting with these patients at this time. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Ruth, for the introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank all of our, uh, my, uh, my co-hosts uh, today who are on the, uh, who made time for this important uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> and just to uh, give you a bit of background, uh, I'm a neurologist and I look after patients. My area of expertise is in neurodegenerative disorders and I look after patients who are suffering from uh, um, and, and, and help their families who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease, mild cognitive impairment, Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia. Uh, as well as just uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, frontal temporal dementia. Um, and I see patients that suffer from cognitive impairment also due to uh, strokes and vascular disease. So I cover not every single disease that we're going to be uh, covering, uh, talking about today, but I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I'll just give you a brief introduction. The Ontario Neurodegenerative Disease Research Initiative is mainly set out to understand um, not only about these individual diseases and how they compare to each other. Uh, but, but one thing that we're learning is that if you're over the age of 65, you're more than likely to have one of these types of, more than one of these pathologies causing the symptoms, either cognitive decline, uh, motor or behavioral features of these diseases. And so Andre has been uh, established in order for us to try to understand how they, these different disorders can synergize together to produce decline as our loved ones uh, age. Um, and so one thing that I think uh, just to get started about what's going on um, <clears throat> with the COVID situation in Ontario um, is a lot of my patients, uh, for example, with Parkinson's disease and with FDD, um, <clears throat> they have been experiencing unique challenges. So uh, many of my patients who suffer from Parkinson's disease <clears throat> have had, sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> um, many of my patients who suffer from Parkinson's disease um, have had challenges because they used to be involved in exercise programs such as dancing with Parkinson's disease. And now they've been essentially confined to the home and are not able to do the same levels of exercise. And they feel that their motor symptoms, for example, are getting worse. Uh, challenges that some of my 
patients and their families suffering from frontal temporal dementia are experiencing as a result of, of COVID is that often patients that have a variant of frontal temporal dementia, which presents with lots of behavioral troubles. So sometimes they can become impulsive and, and have uh, troubles inhibiting themselves. Um, they often want to go outside of the house and, 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 and walk um, with, you know, with their caregivers or, or alone, and they can't do that now. And so being confined to the house is a, a big challenge for them because they used to be able to get out and distract themselves with things in their environment outside, and now they're kind of confined to the house. And so that, that's a challenge for, you know, the patients will get frustrated and, and caregivers will also uh, is, experience uh, lots of troubles with this um, as, as well. So there's unique challenges to every single one of the diseases that, you know, uh, that we see and treat uh, that family and caregivers are experiencing. And I'm happy to kind of <clears throat> talk more broadly about that. Another way that this disease has been impacting um, is it, uh, impacting families and patients suffering from neurodegenerative diseases and also stroke is that there is a fear about leaving the house to go to the emergency department. Uh, for example, <clears throat> our stroke numbers uh, that we've been seeing at Sunnybrook, at least for the first few weeks of this, went down a bit. And we don't know whether or not there was just fear for people that were having acute symptoms of a stroke where they became paralyzed on one side of their body. And they should have gone to the hospital because we have treatments that could be administered uh, very quickly and in a timely fashion. They were avoiding going to the hospital because of fear. And so that's another thing that I think we should talk about, about how COVID is impacting, you know, people that <clears throat> should be going to the hospital uh, because there are treatments that can help, that can reduce the disability from diseases like a stroke. Or for example, um, if patients develop uh, an infection and they need to be treated with antibiotics, it's very important for that to get, you know, assessed very quickly because that can produce delirium uh, in patients that suffer from Alzheimer's disease, and the, as an example, so there are many challenges that COVID has has been uh, Im have imposed on uh, our ability as physicians to care for our patients with these diseases. Um, and I'll be taught. I'm happy to answer questions about this. So I'll stop there and uh, and and uh, let Ruth uh, take over. Okay. Terrific. Thank you. I will, I will take over and share my screen. There we go. Okay. Next, we're very privileged to have Dr. Kathy McGilton join us today. Dr. McGilton obtained her three nursing degrees, her undergraduate, master's, and PhD from the University of Toronto. Dr. McGilton works as a senior scientist at Toronto Rehab Institute, part of the UHN. She's also a professor at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. Dr. McGilton's research focus is on care for persons with cognitive impairment, particularly in identifying interventions and models of care delivery that lead to effective outcomes. Please help me welcome Dr. Kathy McGilton. And I'll be moving her slides forward for her. Great. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Okay, super. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit of my work. Um, as um, Ruth mentioned, I'm a nurse. A lot of my work actually focuses on um, maintaining function and helping persons with dementia maintain their function um, as they progress in their disease trajectory. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I particularly know that during this time, um, as Mero mentioned, Isolation is a huge issue in terms of making sure we take care of our body, mind, and soul, because it's actually very easy to become a little depressed, frustrated. Um, let's be honest, we all have new rules we have to live with, and it's tricky. So I'm going to share with you sort of how I sort of conceptualize what some of us might be going through and what we try to do within this notion of reablement. And reablement is this notion that we all for the most part, can be reabled. There are times in our lives that we either get sick, we might need to go to the hospital, um, or even as our disease progresses, we need to always be thinking about how can we be reabled so we can get back to uh, our healthier self in, in ways socially, functionally, physically, um, and cognitively. 
And so when we put this framework together, and I was working with some um, uh, ger geriatricians actually in the UK and in Australia, we decided that we should probably focus on three main areas. One of them is maintaining function as long as possible. And actually, WHO says this is the number one priority for most of us as we get older. It gets a little more complicated sometimes when you have a diagnosis, a neurological diagnosis. Regaining lost function when there's a, a potential to do so. This is also incredibly important. What we do see often is some of our clients lose function when they go into like acute care hospitals, for instance, or they have had a stroke. Um, but there's often a potential to kind of regain some of those abilities. And um, that's a real focus of my work. What are the remaining abilities and how do we um, enhance and compensate and last is adopt to loss function that cannot be regained. So eventually with the disease, we, there are, it comes a time where it's, it's impossible to regain function. So then we have to support the individual. So I think depending on where you're at in your phase of or your stage of dementia, you may be with any, any one of these. So I'm gonna just ask for the next slide and I'll talk more specifically how, why it's so important that we have to maintain function during this time. And I'm going to give you some examples of how we might be able to do that in your home uh, with your a caregiver. So it's important to sort of think about cognitive function. How do we maintain, again, the abilities that we have cognitively? We don't want them to slip. Uh, so we might want to look at old photos. We might want to think about cooking a favorite recipe, sharing favorite songs or movies. Because sometimes things are familiar to us, makes us, makes us feel much better and is good for our cognition. We might return to reading, listening to music, um, puzzles, again, and some of these activities are, could be quite soothing. In terms of physical functioning, I mean, uh, we know it's quite important to maintain function and physical activity is one way to do it. So we are allowed to go out still for walks and if possible, continue to do that. The other thing that we can do, which is really, really good for us in terms of maintaining function is to maintain our ability to keep walking. And one of the well, the best ways to do this is actually sit to stand in your own house. In fact, I've seen some clients create a little um, pathway in their house where they actually put seats in different places and they walk from one seat to sit and stand, walk to the next place, sit and stand, etc. And to help remember how many laps, you might use sticky notes if you want to do it 10 times, your cards. So some really good strategies that you can actually maintain very good function in your own home. And again, sitting to standing is probably one of the best exercises. Can we go to the next slide, please? It's also, and this is actually, I just found this resource, and actually I wanted to let you know that my PhD student, Sharin, helped me put this together. She actually found this, and I really liked it. It was from the RGP. Um, and so this is actually called SLOT. It's stretch, lift, or tap. And so they talk about, again, how older adults can stay active indoor during the COVID-19 and the importance that we can lose muscle mass if we're not active. So this is, you know, to get you uh, primed and ready to go. But there's also some really nice tips here about how to keep yourself motivated, things to do on a daily basis, routines are important. Uh, start small, for instance, keep progress on a diary if you want, which, um, and also ask friends or family to keep you accountable if you can't seem to keep up with the schedule of sorts. And use, and they also have mobility games to keep the fun going. So I think this is an, a good resource that you might want to um, invest in. Next, thank you. So another way to maintain function is to think about our social function. And that's actually quite crucial. Isolation is very challenging. Again, it is not social <laughs> isolate, but to um, it does cause us to actually become a little more isolated in our home. So we really need to have these day-to-day -day routines, uh, try to come up with some tasks and expectations, and make sure that our assistive, assistive devices are working. And I'm hoping you have access. Um, and I, I do know if you've broken your glasses, there are some optometrists that are available to help you um, get a new pair. And also make sure we have conversations throughout the day. You know, how, what are you, how are you doing? Keeping track of each other's mental health is really important. And listening and responding positively and following up, I think, is essential. Thanks. Next slide. So sometimes we have issues where we maybe have lost a bit of our function. And then we need to think about, hmm, maybe we have to try to compensate for that person. So as we become a little bit more impaired, uh, this might happen more if something happened, like you had a big fever or, or if you got a bit sick, 
you might need a little bit more help in your house um, to regain this potential. So sometimes we think of things like trying to make home modifications so that you can uh, get around a little easier. You might want to think about decluttering the spaces, making sure you have appropriate lighting, and um, reduce any competing noises. Because sometimes if you're not feeling great, all of this, the environment can really actually influence our cognition. So when we think about how to uh, make changes in the environment so our cognition is better. We also might want to think about functional changes and compensating for any that you might have. So if we're forgetting a bit more, you may want to, for instance, start using timers. I know a lot of uh, persons that are starting to use the Google um, to give you some suggestions and tips on uh, timing and also even asking questions. Sometimes those in-house uh, products work quite nicely. Encouraging independence kind of essential. I think what happens when we're caregiving sometimes, it's, it's quite easy for us to do things for our family members. But in fact, one of the best things we can do is encourage independence. So continue to try to encourage your family member to do as much as they can and just support them when required. And again, maintaining routines is essential. There comes a time with our with our disease trajectory that it's very hard to regain because there is a decline. And so for that, we'd actually be compensating more if you're the caregiver. So again, it would be up to you to start the conversation. And maybe you'd want to talk about current events, anything like COVID-19, please and thanks. Um, is there anything that you'd like to mention that could bring joy to someone's lives? How their grandchildren are doing, for instance, very important. Getting outside is still incredibly good for us, our soul. Providing support, so this is where we might have to provide a little bit more care with bathing, meal preparation, and hobbies, and we'd have to compensate and take more of a lead. And of course, technology, and there's a lot of work being done now on how important it is to stay connected by intranets, maybe video games, phone calls, and media broadcasts. And I don't know if you have noticed this, but there's some amazing like virtual museum tours out there, for instance, that actually would be quite wonderful to go back to a place you had visited previously and have a wonderful discussion of what that's like. Well, I'm, I have a few references and I would love to answer any questions you have later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McGilton. Next, we're thrilled to have Dr. Nathan Stahl presenting. Dr. Dr. Stahl received his undergraduate training at McGill University and his medical degree from Western University. He then completed his residency in internal medicine and fellowship training in geriatric medicine at the University of Toronto. He is currently completing his PhD at the U of T as well. Dr. Stahl has been a geriatrician at Sinai Health Systems since, since 2017, where his clinical work focuses on acute uh, care geriatrics. He's also a doctor, his doctoral uh, research um, uses large administrative databases to study the, the population health impact of care, caregiving for dementia. Please help me welcome Dr. Nathan Stahl. Thank Dr. you, Stahl, sorry, I just, need, yeah, oh, sorry, I just needed, I couldn't, I'm, I couldn't unmute myself. Um, I don't know if you watched the virtual parliament yesterday, but I had flashbacks of that from uh, what they were showing yesterday. Um, so thank you very much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Um, I So as, uh, as Ruth introduced, my uh, focus of research and, a lot, and um, increasingly my some of my uh, clinical work as well uh, is focused on caregiving and specifically caregiving for persons with dementia. And so I know Dr. Maselli's talked a little bit about the clinical side of how persons uh, living with neurodegenerative disorders are, have been affected by this pandemic, but I'll speak a little bit about the caregiving side. Um, so we know um, even before this pandemic uh, started that uh, every day about one in four Canadians is caring for a family member or a friend. Um, and uh, nearly half of all Canadians will do so at some point in their life. Um, and what's remarkable and is not often recognized, but is probably something that all of you or many of you listening are acutely aware of, is that about 75% of all sort of direct home and community care services are actually provided unpaid by family members and friends. 
And so the, the numbers of hours that family members and friends are putting in to look after these individuals in the community and sustain them there, uh, for someone who does not have a neurodegenerative disorder, it's an average of about 19 hours a week. And then that number uh, exceeds or significantly increases when you're talking about conditions that are, have intense caregiving responsibilities like people living with dementia. And so those are, you know, that, and along with that, about, even though it can be a rewarding experience for many, um, about a, a quarter of those caring for older adults experience some distress related to their caregiving. And that number in Ontario, we know, goes up to about 45% of all uh, caregivers experience some, some form of distress related to their caregiving role. And that was before this sort of reality of COVID-19 that we've now uh, dove into. And I would argue, and I'll, I'll make the case, that um, I don't think we've, uh, that the, the health systems and decision makers have necessarily considered the needs of caregivers, uh, particularly family and friend caregivers, during this time uh, as fully as they ought to have. So to start off with, um, you know, there is the, the caregiving role, um, again, as, as many of you will know, the sort of prevailing uh, assumption about the caregiving role is that um, and this, this sort of inappropriate term that's applied to it is that this is something informal, um, that, this is real, that this is something that people do to help sort of with basic emotional tasks and basic activities of daily living. But you all know that the caregiving role is much more complex than that. And most caregivers are providing intense, almost medical or nursing care uh, to the people they are looking after. The challenge with COVID-19 um, is that firstly, the vast majority of people who get COVID-19 will be looked after in the community. Only a minority are requiring hospitalization. And so for caregivers who, who live with these individuals, um, they may have to take on the role of not only providing the existing caregiving responsibilities for the conditions they were before the pandemic, but now should the, the, person, the care recipient fall ill with COVID, they may be responsible for looking after their, their infection as well. The challenge is, is that most caregivers don't have access to personal protective equipment like acute and critical care systems might. Uh, there's a lack of information uh, about how to manage uh, somebody with COVID-19 that's sort of caregiver specific. And as we all know, most of the support systems um, uh, have been increasingly shuttered in the outpatient setting. So there's a lack of resources to call upon. And, and, and that also includes um, even though many of these uh, services are still available, that there is fear, uh, understandably, about having home care workers that may be hired or through or publicly funded come into the home because of the fact that we know these individuals often work in multiple homes. And again, they may have a lack of access to personal protective equipment. So certainly the, the COVID pandemic has placed increased demands on caregiving, uh, both making the existing care conditions a little bit more difficult to care for, and certainly for those who do get the infection, challenges related to caring for them in the home. I would say the other, um, one of the other aspects that has been challenging is that a lot of the information and also the guidance and the things we're being asked to do uh, certainly doesn't take into account uh, people living with neurodegenerative disorders. So when you're talking about um, social dis or physical distancing as it is now called, that might be nearly impossible for someone with, uh, for a person living with dementia. Um, and, and this is a challenge actually in long-term care homes, but the person with dementia who wanders may not be able to physically distance themselves. And so they themselves might, one, be at higher risk of contracting COVID if they're uh, not able to, to isolate the same way others are, but they also may be a vector for spreading COVID-19. And these things, can these things can result in fear for the caregiver, it can also result in feelings of shame for some in that, you know, the things that everyone's being asked to do and to, to distance may be an impossibility or a very difficult reality. And I would say the final um, area I wanted to touch on today, and then certainly like all other panelists, I'd be very happy to take questions, is that People, caregivers are being asked to make a lot of difficult decisions and contemplate difficult things within a very accelerated time frame. Um, so a lot of the conversation early on, um, which related to uh, rationing of um, 
uh, of limited medical resources. And thankfully, we have not gotten to a point uh, during this pandemic where we've overwhelmed our acute and critical care systems. But a lot of those conversations were very, very difficult um, because it centered around which criteria would be utilized. It centered around, um, in some jurisdictions, using age. It centered around, in some jurisdictions, um, having neurodegenerative disorders as a criteria for these, these decisions. And, and as I say, thankfully, these triage decisions have not um, been, been needed and we have not had the surge, but that was a, a huge source of stress for many caregivers. And then finally, decisions around hospitalization and, and, and um, those who live in residential care facilities have been very difficult uh, because we know that people with some neurodegenerative disorders can decompensate in hospital independent of their condition that brought them in. When you have a lack of visitation policies to prevent the spread of diseases, um, that makes it very, very challenging uh, because one, you don't get your own line of sight into what's going on. And, and secondly, many caregivers will know that the person they look after may do better when they're physically present with them in the hospital. And then um, those who have people in residential care settings, whether these are nursing or retirement homes, this has been a, you know, this is the ground zero of COVID-19 in, in North America. And the decisions that caregivers have been faced with um, have been extraordinarily challenging. Uh, being asked questions like, should they pull their loved one out of the, a nursing home? What information do they have? How do they keep their loved one safe? Uh, in the nursing home. And these have been extraordinarily challenging times and continue to be. So those are some of the, the issues that I've seen discussed uh, sort of amongst caregivers and, and those who, those, those caregivers that I've interacted with uh, over the time of the pandemic. Um, and, and some things to really keep in mind as you consider sort of what Dr. McGilton mentioned about ways to sort of keep your mind and soul uh, as rejuvenated as possible because we do recognize that you know this is a particularly stressful time for everyone in society but arguably no more so for those caregivers particularly for people looking after those with neurodegenerative disorders so um, with that i'll conclude but again very happy to take questions and thanks so much for having me here today thank you so much dr stall we really appreciate your contribution Next, uh, okay, let me get the presentation. Great. Finally, we have the honor of, of, uh, of hearing from Mrs. Jill Churchman. So Jill has been a full-time caregiver for the past five years to her husband, David, who is 53 years of age and, and living with behavior variant FTD. Jill and her husband were part of both Andre's original study as well as Andre at home. And she's also a caregiver representative on Andre's patient and community advisory uh, committee. Jill chooses to find the good in each day, and she hopes that she can help others by sharing her experience with you today. Please help me welcome Jill Churchman. Hello, everyone, and thank you for including me. I'm going to share with you some of the tools that have helped me as a caregiver make positive changes and life a little less stressful. Remember, what you are not changing, you are choosing. First thing I would like to address is the importance of getting one's affairs in order. Having to make emergency medical decisions is hard enough without having family arguing over what they thought someone's wishes were. Tell your friends and family, give someone a trust, someone you trust a copy of your wills and make sure to include passwords and logins to online accounts. Also have an emergency plan in place in case something happens to you as the caregiver. Next slide. Mind over mood, oh, we haven't got to the next slide yet. No, I apologize. Sorry, <laughs> there you go. So Mind Over Mood is a fabulous book that teaches you to change the way you feel by changing the way you think. So I'd like everyone to take both hands and squeeze as tight as you can, make two fists and hold on to those fists as tight, tight, tight as you can. And I can see people who aren't doing it, so please <laughs> make, make two fists. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is a representation of stress. People hold on to their stress. And now if you let go, you can see that it's much easier to let go than to hold on to all the negative emotions and stress you experience as a caregiver each day. 
Holding on to those feelings and thoughts will cause you more pain and discomfort. Learning to let go takes a little bit of practice, but it can be life-changing. After David's diagnosis, I began a journal. It started out as finding one thing to be grateful for each day. And some days were very tough, and I would write something as simple as the sky was blue today. Journaling about the person you are caring for can be a great communication tool at your next doctor's appointment to discuss changes, concerns, and questions. Over time, the journal helped me to define, express, and eventually release the anger, fear, and confusion we are all familiar with. I try to journal from an unemotional place as though I am a reporter on a scene. As a caregiver, the changes happening sometimes blur together and journaling allows me to look back on what has happened and to reflect on what I have learned from those experiences. It helps me to see that being a caregiver does not define who I am. Another great tip is to set aside a certain amount of time each day to worry. I know that sounds sort of silly, but think of the things you can control, oh, sorry, you can control and those things out of our control. With COVID-19, we can control where we go, hand washing, who comes into our homes, and having them follow the safety protocols, including masks, gloves, and more hand washing. Do not let your fears, worries, and stress take over. Dedicate 10 to 15 minutes a day to address the concerns, and then when time is up, move on. During COVID-19, many companies are including free trials of apps on your phone or your tablet to help you manage stress and anxiety through meditation. Meditation is a tool that will help to teach you how to breathe and calm your mind. I recommend starting with a two minute exercise and increase time as you feel comfortable. Next slide. Yes, I apologize. I've had some trouble with the slides. That's okay. <laughs> There we go. Staying positive. I believe that staying positive is so important for yourself and your loved one. I also recommend to lower or if possible, remove expectations because the higher the expectations that you set, the more disappointed you will be. You need to have as much compassion for yourself as you do for other people. Live in the now, let go of the past and make simple plans for the future. The strategy I use to create a more peaceful environment is to not think about what I am not, like what I could be doing, but instead I make the conscious choice to be present with David. This means often joining his world, not correcting him and being wrong even when I know I'm right. This creates peace in our home and between us. Although it is easier to say no, I have learned over time, it is better to say yes. Next slide. As important it is, as it is to look after your loved one, it is especially important during these uncertain times to ensure that you consider your needs as essential. Respite is defined as a short period of rest or relief from something difficult or unpleasant. Respite is defined, oh sorry, as a caregiver, it is important to define what respite means to you. What will help you as a caregiver reduce your emotional and mental stressors? Talk this over with family, friends, and your community care partners, including anyone coming into your home to help. They can't help you until you learn to ask for what you need and ask again when the needs change. People often use the term self-care. For me personally, this means getting enough sleep, eating healthy, and finding time to exercise. Sleep should be the number one priority for you and your loved one. Lack of sleep will make you both irritable, you will have little patience, and you will feel crappy. <laughs> if you or your loved one are not sleeping seven to eight hours per night, please call your doctor and figure out a plan to make a good night's sleep a reality. Personally, I choose to wake up every day 30 minutes before David so that I can enjoy a hot cup of tea with my breakfast alone. This time in the morning, allows me to prepare for the day. Try to establish a routine and stick to it. Change can be extremely difficult on those with dementia. With the current social distancing practices in place, 
I am also making sure that I am staying connected with friends and family through weekly Zoom meetings and lots of phone calls. Hobbies, meditation, and going for a walk around our neighborhood and keeping the house as decluttered as possible have been crucial in helping me to not feel overwhelmed or burnt out at the end of each day in isolation. I hope these suggestions help you find a more positive approach to an even tougher situation. I have provided Ruth with a list of a lot of resources that she will send out to all of you following this presentation. Just remember to be kind to yourself and to the one you're taking care of. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Jill. We really appreciate it. That was a great contribution. And now uh, we'll start opening up to questions. So thank you to all four of our speakers. Terrific job. Uh, we really appreciate your contribution. Um, I'd like to start just the questions with uh, Dr. Macellis and just asking you if you could talk a little bit about Andre, uh, the Ontario Brain Institute and, and why we brought people together today for the webinar. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, I, I think that um, I, I want to thank all the speakers for their unique perspectives in terms of uh, what they're providing. I, I, I think that the main reason why um, at Andre as the organization <clears throat> wanted to provide this webinar um, is because, you know, we know that uh, caregivers and 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 patients are going through a lot right now, and I think that um, there's a lot of fear out there that um, you know regarding COVID and exposure to COVID, um, but there's also um, a, and that fear is resulting in change and change for for you know patients change for their, their, their caregivers. And, and, and so we're here to be able to answer questions uh, for that you may have regarding, you know, things happening um, in your house. Uh, I saw one of the questions that uh, someone had asked was um, hallucinations are getting worse since this has begun for a patient. And what should we do about that? What might be a reason for it? Um, as kind of one change. And, you know, from my perspective, if, if a person is suffering from dementia and if they develop new onset of hallucinations or if they're having worsening of existing hallucinations, it's an indicator that there may be something like an infection going on. And as I had mentioned right at the very beginning of the talk, um, I think that um, it's very important for us to be able to, you know, make sure that uh, they can be checked for like a, a urine infection could be something that could worsen their condition and getting on antibiotics can help that person with those hallucinations. So what we want to, what we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is, is that we're, we're doing this, this, uh, we organize this webinar to be able to kind of provide you with information as, as, as both patients and caregivers um, about what we should be looking for uh, red flags, uh, but also what you can be doing to kind of help the situation. Um, so those are the, that's why, you know, we, we, we set this up today and I'm hap happy to answer other questions. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, another question that's come in is, uh, and I'd like to address this to, to uh, Jill Churchman how to address uh, grief that is surfacing in these difficult, difficult times. So how, how do we address bereavement while we're isolated? I think the main thing to remember is um, because of the provincial restrictions that 10 people can gather in a funeral home at one time, um, so many people close to the deceased are not even able to say their goodbyes. So we have to think about when this is over, how we're going to help those people. Um, especially through maybe bringing a family food and just taking the time to be able to spend with them. Um, keep them close to you now if you can through Zoom meetings and keep contact, call them. Um, let them know that you're thinking of them so they don't feel so alone. And um, there's so much grief that's happening 
that nobody has very much control over. Um, you know, there's a stigma that people may think your loss is related to COVID-19 and maybe it hasn't been. That's another thing to consider. Um, just when it's over, there's going to have to be a greater need to help and support for those people. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Stoll, uh, should people remove their family from long-term care and, uh, um, and, and if they're new to it, should they place uh, people, to, should they place family members in long-term care? There's been lots in the news about this and I wonder if you could address this for the audience. Yeah, so I really, uh, I don't like the premise of, of the question about should people uh, be removing their loved one from long-term care. I think it's, um, it's sort of, uh, it unfairly downloads the decision onto caregivers and loved ones when in the first place, I would argue that we should have been providing um, the conditions to ensure the security and safety of people in long-term care. Because the reality is for most uh, family members and caregivers, pulling them out of long-term care is not a reality, uh, whether it's for financial reasons, whether it's because they can't, um, they can't take on the physical or emotional or psychological uh, burden of providing the caregiving uh, responsibilities, or thirdly, because they're justifiably worried about uh, a worsening in the condition of the person they're pulling out because changes of environment and loss of routine can be very troubling. Now, uh, it, it's indisputable that what's going on in long-term care right now is very, very troubling in terms of the number of homes under outbreak, uh, the size of these outbreaks, and the number of deaths that have tragically occurred uh, because of what's going on inside the long-term care facilities. So if I'm not saying that people should or should not do this, um, but... Um, you know, so for people, and people have done this, and, and they've actually restrict, they've, re they've um, loosened the restrictions around how long somebody can be out of long term care before they lose their bed. So now they've extended that to 90 days. So some people have made that decision. Um, and, and that's fine. Um, but, but I think that when we have a question like this, and it's, and it's, it's sort of propagated through media and mainstream press, for the vast majority of caregivers that are unable to do this, I think it creates a lot of fear and, and guilt, I would argue. And I'm not sure it's the most helpful of questions, to be honest. Um, and so my, you know, when I speak to people about this, I try and, and pivot or flip it to say, you know, what can we be better doing at this point in time to support those that are in long-term care and to make these safer places to live during the COVID-19 pandemic? And I think there's actually a lot that, that I'd be happy to speak to. Your second part of the question related to about, was related to about admissions to long-term care now. And uh, most, uh, many homes are not having admissions right now. Um, so the decision may be made for some people. There are still homes that um, are not under outbreak. Um, and I'm not, I'm, I'm actually not sure whether those homes are actually still accepting admissions into their, into their long-term care homes. But I would think that most places are not uh, having many new admissions at this time. Uh, and, and the homes that are under broke outbreak by public health orders certainly cannot accept new admissions. So the, the new admissions that are happening would be happening in homes that are not under outbreak. So those are probably, uh, you know, safer places for, for the new admissions to go into. So I know that's a, <laughs> that's a, a wordy answer, but I think it's a very, uh, it's a very sort of, uh, it's very troubling what's going on. And I'm, I'm that whole question of sort of just pulling them out is, has been, it really can strike fear and, and guilt into the hearts of a lot of people. And so I think there's a lot more we can do in other ways rather than just downloading that onto our, the family caregivers. Okay, thank you. Um, I see some questions up here that are interesting. Um, how can I best support a client and caregiver who has been diagnosed with dual ALS and FTD? Can someone in the, uh, in the panels address that please? Um, I'm happy to, to, to uh, speak to that. Um, so ALS and FTD can uh, not infrequently coexist. 
um, in the same person. And that's a challenge. So ALS is a disease whereby uh, your motor system degenerates. And so uh, patients will develop troubles with weakness um, and lose muscle strength and muscle bulk. They can have difficulties with swallowing and breathing. Um, but the same, the same changes in the brain that cause the motor weakness can also cause uh, behavioral symptoms. Um, and so patients can at the same time develop troubles with uh, disinhibition, doing things that are, are, are out of character uh, to them. Um, out of character for them, uh, they can get themselves in trouble because they become, they lose their filter and they can say things and upset people. Uh, so it is a real challenge. Um, first of all, I think that um, it's important that uh, we have specialized clinics that can help patients diagnosed with ALS in terms of their motor weakness, in terms of their breathing troubles, and there's different strategies that can help them breathe easier. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, there could be a referral to that clinic. From the behavioral perspective, I think what's very important um, is trying from the FTD behavioral perspective, it's very important to provide, uh, you know, consistent, uh, a consistent environment. Um, patients that suffer from any form of dementia uh, have troubles adapting to new situations. And that's uh, in particular, uh, that's 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 actually uh, not specific for uh, frontal temporal dementia, but it's it, it is it is a very it's it's seen very frequently in frontal temporal dementia, um, and so it's hard for patients to adapt to new situations, and so trying to keep their environment as consistent as possible is important. Uh, trying to uh, redirect uh, patients if they get kind of obsessed with a certain type of behavior, trying to help redirect them without upsetting them. If the behavior is not particularly disruptive, it's not putting the patient at harm or anyone else in, at harm, I think it's very important that, you know, you, 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 you know, if you let them do what they're doing, as long as, as long as it's not causing any injury or harm to, to them or to others, uh, at least for a short while. Um, I, I think that uh, these are some strategies, but it is a, a very challenging situation to be dealing with both diagnoses. And, and unfortunately, in patients that have FTD, we see often the overlap between the two of them. Okay, terrific. Uh, a question for, for Jill. Um, how do you deal with 360 degree turn in behavior that occurs almost instantly? So this happens a lot in our house. <laughs> Uh, David can go from being calm to being outraged for something as simple as me saying, no, we can't do that right now. Um, I find music is a big help. We, through the Alzheimer's Society, got him an iP um, I was it called, an iPod? Yeah. And um, they downloaded all his favorite music. So I find if he's very stressed, it's very easy to hand him some music and say, oh, have you heard this song? And Right away, he's distracted and he calms down. Another thing is to have a, a set of distractions ready. It's like having a small child. It related often to having the kids when they were four and five years old and they were upset. We would have, you know, costume time or we'd go into a different room and go investigate something or I'd get them to fold washcloths or tea towels. And I find those things work with David just as well. I'll say, oh, the dishes need emptying out of the dishwasher. Even though he puts them in the wrong place, it doesn't matter. He's just changed what he was upset about and will go and do an activity. So hopefully that can help you. Very good. May I Thank add you. that? Um, in terms of, so Joe, fabulous suggestions. I also think what I do when we're working with staff, and I do a lot of work in nursing homes, is we try to think about what might have um, helped accelerate or what could have caused this type of what we're calling responsive behaviors when people become agitated. We tried to change the terminology to more responsive behaviors instead of challenging behaviors because we often try to teach staff that they may be responding to some unmet need. So when you think about hierarchy, Maslow's hierarchy, um, could it be that they are all of a sudden quite hungry they're in pain. This is again perhaps somebody that can't tell us. 
um, trying to actually predict what might cause some of these uh, behaviors. So we do our best to do some assessment, try to be you know, an investigator, eliminate some of the issues, because I think that sometimes helps as well in terms of prevention. And not everything can be prevented. We know that, and there are pathologies that cause people to become quite upset, like you said, within 360. But we really do our best to think about what could it have been? Could it have been we were all of a sudden very cold? We often think about the environment, how that it can influence. We think about approaches to the individual. Did we scare them? I mean, sometimes we walk in and we forget to say good morning um, if we're in, our, in a rush. So we sort of sit back and think, hmm, what was it that maybe we did to contribute to that, the environment? Or perhaps they got frustrated because we were um, maybe uh, sort of disabling them more than enabling them. So just want to keep that in mind too. Sometimes prevention works too. Very good. Thank you. Dr. Stahl, another one for you. Um, my mom had a stroke February 25th. I managed to arrange a placement into a retirement facility upon discharge from rehab. How can I support my mom at this time as she is going through the process of losing her independence and family home? Anger is a real issue at this time. Yeah, so uh, good question. I think Dr. Uh, Rick Schwartz had um, written a, a text response in the, in the chat. Um, and you know, it's uh, he 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 highlighted, which I would concur with, uh, that it's very important to address both the social changes that uh, she's going through, as well as the sort of physical and neurochemical changes that can happen after a stroke. So there are well-described post-stroke mood changes uh, that are common um, that may need to be addressed by the the medical. Uh, or the stroke physicians uh, that were looking after uh, her mom. Um, and yes, absolutely switching to a new environment, um, particularly a new environment where uh, most retirement homes have uh, no visitation policies and retirement homes that are under outbreak may also be under lockdown where people can also not leave the facility as well. So um, there has not been an opportunity for someone who moves into one of these uh, homes to necessarily acculturate to them or to socialize in them. So they've been moved basically into a foreign environment that's under lockdown could be extremely stressful. So, um, you know, what, what are the things that I could say to this? There aren't, there aren't. So in addition to, uh, again, following up with the physicians who have uh, the stroke care physicians, the other ones are sort of the the typical sort of responses that people give, but I think it's it's sort of the best we have right now, which is you know leveraging technology to our advantage. So many homes are actually making time for virtual visits. Some retirement homes I've actually seen, which is something you could talk about doing, have actually constructed um, visitation booths um, that have sort of a plexiglass uh, barrier where. Uh, people can go up to one side of it and visit with their loved one on the other side so they can still communicate and have some social interaction. And then, I mean, my own grandmother's actually in a retirement home. It's, you know, we've had the whole, we've had, uh, I drive by and do the window visits uh, through the cell phone, right? So there are ways to make people feel that they are connected uh, even in even in this time of physical distancing, right? So someone brought up that the term should no longer be social distancing, but the WHO has changed it, it's physical distancing. So it's remaining physically distant, but, um, but keeping socially connected. And I think, you know, th there are some creative ways to think about doing that. And I think small gestures, even like window visits can make huge differences uh, to people at this difficult time. Terrific, thank you. Um, you brought up Dr. Dr. Uh, Rick Swartz, and I think I'll, uh, I'll let Rick have a, a couple of words to say as well. He's, uh, he's one of the other leads on, on the Andre project, and, and I'd love to uh, have him on as well, just to say a couple of words to probably address that question as well, as well as just introduce himself. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to take a moment uh, as we're uh, running out of time and uh, acknowledge uh, both our funders and our speakers. So. Uh, the Ontario Brain Institute uh, funds Andre. Andre is the Ontario Neurodegenerative Research Initiative, and it's uh, really multidisciplinary, as you as you see by our speakers, by our patients, and uh, and caregivers, and community advisory panels. Uh, we are really integrating uh, 
trying to do science and discovery in a bit of a different way by integrating the patient voice, by integrating uh, care organizations, by working with uh, commercial companies, industry, government, as well as clinicians and scientists around the province to address uh, across neurodegenerative diseases. So to be looking at dementia, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, frontotemporal dementia, and the contributions of stroke and vascular disease. And uh, this webinar really highlights some of the value of coming together uh, that, that the OBI, the Ontario Brain Institute, really uh, is trying to model in these types of, of uh, programs. So Andre is one of the programs funded by OBI. And, and our program really uh, is about bringing people together across these diseases uh, to look at commonalities, to look at differences, uh, and to sort of break down traditional barriers and traditional silos um, in, in research and also in care. And I think this is a great example. The, the panel that we, that we have together, uh, Focus Neurology and Caregiving Expertise, Geriatrics, Nursing, and the Patient and, and, and Caregiver Voice is a great example of, uh, of the Andre and OBI approach. And we uh, are just very, very grateful for the time and, and effort of the speakers. So thank you very much. And for the engagement of, of the audience, I'm sorry that uh, we, we don't have a lot more time for questions. I wanted to get this thank you in. I think we might have two or three more minutes and we do have a couple of quick questions coming in. So with that, I'll stop talking and, and save the last couple of minutes for questions. But again, I just really wanted to thank our speakers uh, for really a wonderful webinar. And we will be posting this uh, to YouTube and, and on the Andre website uh, so people can uh, download, listen to parts they want to see again, and uh, for the speakers that are willing to share their resources, we'll do that as well. Thank you again. Thanks so much, Dr. Swartz. Uh, we have a question from Carolyn that um, that sounds good. Uh, well, I guess it, it's been answered um, through the group chat, but why don't we chat about it a little bit? Um, my father is caring for my mother who has dementia, and they are in isolation. We are supporting them from a distance, and when we ask and when we ask how they are, everyone, everything is fine. Any suggestion on how we can probe further? I saw a great thing the other day online, and it was for the family to put three different colors in the window. So if everything's okay in your house, you put a green sign in the window. Things are kind of that you are needing a little bit of help, you put a yellow sign in the window. And if you're in a crisis situation, put red in the window. That way, People could just drive by and see, and uh, your family can gauge how they're doing. That's great. And anyone else have, a, have an answer to that question? So I sort of briefly answered in the group chat, which is, um, you know, leverage technology again, especially with video, because sometimes you can get uh, a line of sight uh, into the home and you can pick up things subtly uh, when you have a video of the home environment. And the second thing is that, uh, as many people know, there is a sort of age related stoicism to many of these things. And so sometimes it's better just not to ask and to give or provide. Uh, and particularly when we know what things are difficult right now, groceries, supplies, provisions, uh, just show, showing up with those and, 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 and leaving them um, might be more helpful than asking when the usual answer is probably undoubtedly going to be a no. Absolutely. Great. Okay. I think that is probably uh, a good time, a uh, good note to finish on, a good time to end. So um, we want to really thank you, thank the speakers uh, so much for, for joining us today and, and giving us such a great, great presentation. Um, thank you so much, everyone else, for joining. I uh, really appreciate it. We hope you learned something. Um, and we will follow up with an email with some resources. So Jill had mentioned some resources. We will also try to send that infographic that was shown.